Casey Neistat submitted words to me, but since he's fairly unruly, <laughs> he submitted six words to me. And he said, how about six words? And here are his six words. I just want to make movies. Please welcome him. Do we sit now? I will sit. That was, that was a good introduction, right? I didn't know. There was like some false starts there. Your bodyguards were like, no, don't go out there don't yet. Don't go, don't. And they were like super intimidated. But they know that when I come on stage, I run on stage. I saw that you run on stage too. Yeah, yeah, forcefully. Yeah. To show the energy. So um, Bring it. I very, very much like your six words. Thank you. How, how well do you feel that you have been succeeding in making just movies? Well, I mean, not to uh, over-intellectualize that idea of I just want to make movies, but the word just is probably the most important part of that. Uh, if any of you guys have sort of been following loosely along with my career over the course of my, my vlog, my daily show on YouTube, I wear a lot of hats, and I think that sort of the burden of opportunities is that you can sort of lose sight to what your initial passion was that provided you with those opportunities. And, you know, I say right now I have three full-time jobs and one part-time job, and I think that's a little bit of an understatement for the amount of things that I'm taking on because I have an absolute inability to say no to anyone for anything which is why I'm here with you. Oh, no, today, no. I was, um, I was flattering myself that somehow <laughs> my accent had done it. You're, well, I thought yeah. it was Werner Herzog calling, and I was like, yes, yes, I'm in. <laughs> um, no, so I, it really, like, it, it's given me a greater appreciation for what makes, what gives me the most happiness in life. And I, like, literally talk to my wife about this all the time, but... Um, when I had so much in front of me as far as work and the businesses that I've started and all these things that are interests of mine, I get a little bit away from my passion. And I stopped doing my daily show last fall because I needed to focus on those other aspects of my career. And they all went well, and I just realized I was like totally fucking miserable because I wasn't making anything. And then I make a little movie, and it's like a little three-minute stupid movie. And then the minute I click publish... It's actually upload for those of us who understand YouTube, but for the, for the intellectuals in the room, when I hit publish, it's this overwhelming feeling of success. I did it. I made something. It started, the inception was an idea. The end result was something that I delivered to the universe. And like that is, that's all I ever want to do is just make, and I have to remind myself that everything else I do is in service of just making movies. But it's, it's, close to impossible to just make movies. I have a retirement plan <laughs> that involves just making movies. A central question, um, which I want to come to in different ways during our conversation, and I'd like you to just briefly touch upon it at this moment. Where do you draw the line between advertising and movies? I think that's a, that's a, it's a tough question to answer. Um, and Many I, of my questions might uh, be I better. hope so. <laughs> I can tell you, when I don't answer the question well, as in where does advertising end and movies begin, um, my audience gives me hell for it. And I appreciate like, that kind of, that, I mean, it, it's rather uncouth how the comments literally manifest, but I appreciate the audience letting me know this doesn't work. Because if you ask me objectively, where does advertising end and where do movies begin, I would say that line is almost entirely blurred. Find me a filmmaker and let's look where their financing came. And it will always end in some sort of commercial entity. 
So in its purest form, there is no more culture without some form of monetizing that culture. So like a, you, can, you could take this to a place, it's like all movies are advertisements for something. Um, but I think much more literally on, on YouTube, you know, most of the movies I make are just an idea that I turn into a movie and I put out there. And some of them are enabled by other companies and some are made for other companies. And I think probably the best example of this to date was a movie that I made for Nike. Um, Nike's an American shoe company out of Portland, <laughs> Oregon. You know, thank you. I, I... They, Nike had hired me to make... You've, you, you've gotten me. Wealth yeah. of information. Um, Nike's, Nike hired me to make three commercials for them, and I made two as promised. And then the third one, I went completely rogue. And I went with my best friend and made the movie that I wanted to make. It had nothing to do with their product. The product wasn't even in it at all. There was no Nike in it. I didn't even put Nike at the end. And I delivered that to them. Like, we don't know what this is, but it's great. And that movie went on to be the most watched movie that Nike ever put on the internet. And that was my movie. It was my idea. I never... <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't say, I don't say that to be self-congratulatory. I say that because that, that wasn't a commercial. There was no product in it. It wasn't even about a brand. It was something that I wanted to do. But because, my, uh, because what I wanted to make and what I wanted to say so closely aligned with what this company was trying to say, it was this perfect marriage, this perfect symbiosis, where no one gave a shit that it was made for Nike and because of Nike. They just saw it for what it was. And that's the ultimate success. And I think that uh, Do What You Can't, another short movie that I made earlier this year, is another version of that where it's the perfect marriage. It's a movie I've always wanted to make but couldn't afford to make. It's very point out, and that's that at the beginning when I say to my seventh grade vice principal, whose name is Trent Alexopoulos, he's still alive, I looked him up. <laughs> that photo in that yearbook was actually him. I went on Facebook and I blasted everybody I went to school with, and I was like, who has our seventh grade high school? yearbook, send me a video of Trent Alexopoulos' face. Um, I want to make that man famous. <laughs> and the reason why is he was, a, he was a leader. He was an administrator in my school system for my entire childhood and my brother's childhood and my sister's childhood. And I did something just god-awful. I don't know what it was, something stupid like 12-year-olds do. And I got in trouble like I did all the time. And I remember him so vividly, like this terrible old man halitosis just screaming in my face and telling me with the conviction of someone who ran a school that I was a loser and when I grew up I would either be in jail or working at a gas station. And I just like, I can tell you now, like I'm a father to a 19-year-old and a father to a three-year-old and if there's one thing I know as a parent is that no matter how fucked up a 12-year-old's actions are, you never, ever, ever shut down a kid like that. Like a child. You never say that to a child. And that's why I put his face in there. So in a way, he did you a good service. Well, I really appreciated it in <laughs> retrospect. No, but he, he, he prompted something. I mean, there, he, is, there, he, is, the, no the, greater, the, there is no greater motivation than other people doubting you in life. There's no greater motivation than someone saying, you will never do that. Because, like, vendettas will take you all the way to the end of the line. The shitty thing about vendettas is by the time you actually accomplish what you're looking to accomplish, it doesn't feel as good to say, told you so, as I thought. It's like by the time in life that you can afford that red Ferrari that you wanted when you were 11 years old, you don't want the red Ferrari anymore. What do you want? Well, I ride a skateboard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, I, what I'm taken by watching this video, which is one of the two we will watch in full, um, is the energy, um, the enthusiasm that goes into it. That is something that you, you want to inspire in people. Yeah, I mean, I want to inspire in people. I, 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 think that, I think that setting as an ambition to inspire others is, a, is taboo. It's a little bit like if you have to tell people you're cool, you're definitely not cool. Or if you it, tell them that you're telling them a joke which is funny, it's, it's really not, not funny. funny. And if you say as a mission, I want to inspire people, you're not inspiring people. I like to make the work that would motivate me. Um, it's just like, how do you know when your work is good? It's if I think it's good. Like, I don't care how many downvotes it gets. I don't care if anyone watches it. If I made something that feels really good to me, then, then that's it. And a video like that, I think like, you know, that's a manifesto. That's a, like, it's a call to arms. 
Um, that's the message that I've always wanted to hear. And when it went from the message I always wanted to hear to the message I always wanted to tell um, was, when I had, was when I became able to actually say something like that. There's a wonderful line by Andy Warhol where he says, art is what you can get away with. I'm familiar with that. that, that How does that speak to you? I, mean, I, think that's, I think that's the truth. Art is what you can get away with. Um, I mean, I think the word art is one of the worst swear words in the dictionary. I, I, like, so I don't like to touch that word, but I think I understand what, what he meant by that. It's what you can get away with. It's as far as you can take it. I think the beauty of art or creativity as a whole is that, um, by definition, there is no structure to what it is or what it's defined as. So when art becomes what you can get away with, it's, it's how far can you go and still call it art? Um, I had a very, very fancy dinner last night, and I sat across from a very famous artist, traditional artist, and she and I were talking, and she was expressing her, her uh, frustration with the current art market, how art is sold and how artists are, are treated like, traded like stocks and things like that. Artwork is traded like stocks and things like that. And I said to her, I used to be a fine artist. And she was like, what does that mean? And I was like, well, I used to work in the fine art world. She's like, what does that mean? I used to show in galleries and, and show in museums and sell my artwork through art dealers. And she's like, and you don't make art anymore? And I was like, no, I do. Now I just put it on YouTube and give it away to the world for free. Um, but when did that stop becoming art? And that's why I, I have such negative feelings about that word, is because it's such a siloed word. Um, and I don't think it applies to what I do. Right? For me, it's just it's expressions and where do they belong and how far can it be taken. And that's why YouTube is infinitely more attractive to me than the most prestigious art galleries in the world. Talk about uh, you as a high school dropout. Oh, boy. <laughs> Give us a few more details. Sure. Um, I mean, the most abbreviated version is like, I, lower middle class upbringing, fine house. There was always, we never went hungry as kids, but we always had either macaroni and cheese from the box if my sister was willing to make it for us, or cereal. That was what I was raised on. Um, but I was really like the most troublesome, more of a Dennis the Menace troublesome than like a truly like destructive or, or bullying kind of troublesome kid. I was just always breaking things. Um, and that trouble manifested into something I think much more destructive when my parents got a divorce. And that destructiveness went in all kinds of different directions and it ultimately led to a, an ultimatum delivered to me by my mother, which is sort of shape up or get out of this house. And if there's one thing I'm not good at, it's when people give me ultimatums. Because um, she gave me that ultimatum, how old am I, 30? She gave me that ultimatum 24 years ago, and I left that night and never went back. Um, and I remember, like, I left my parents, I was 15 years old, and I left and I took my box fan with me, because I can't sleep without a fan on my face. And then, you know, I, she was very specific. She was like, I'm not going to give you any money if you leave this house. And I said, Mom, I understand. So I went into my bedroom and I pulled back my water bed and I took all of my savings, which was only like $14,000 in $100 bills um, that I had saved up in the last year from selling dime bags out of the high school parking lot. Um, Sell what? What did you say? <laughs> okay. I, I, okay. They'll clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they understand. Yeah. Vividly. Yeah. Um, in any event, uh, you know, I, I moved in with some girls and started dating one of them and got her pregnant. And, you know, like a, a year later, I was 17 years old and living in a trailer park and on welfare and had a baby. And high school didn't fit into that equation. You know, I was working two full-time jobs, washing dishes to support my young family. And um, because I never, I never went back to school. And I would say by the time I got an opportunity to maybe finish high school, um, opportunity that I could certainly realize now I no longer feel like uh, I'm inhibited in any capacity by my lack of education. Um, but that's, that, was, that was it. But having a child that early must have motivated you in a certain way. I mean, it motivated me, I think, wholly in my life, but not academically. I no, not academically, yeah, yeah. but, but to, in every capacity. to do things. Yeah, I think one question people always get is, especially now, I'm at that age where all of my friends who have not had, yet had kids are starting to panic about having children, and they say, like, what, what about my career, and what about all these things, and what about my life? And I've never not been a 
a parent. I was a child and then I was a parent. So I've never lived without being a, a parent. No, you left, you left your parents to become a parent. Yeah, exactly. And there was never a time that I lived my life as an individual and not been a parent. But I think that for me, um, having a child was what enabled everything. I think that anybody, in, even in this room who has a child, you know the minute your child is born, you stop living for yourself, you start living for someone else. And that's way more powerful. Um, life feels very selfish until, when you have children and look back at your life without children, it seems very selfish, that idea. Um, but no, I, I think that none of this would have been possible if it weren't for, for Owen, my son. Who now is? Well, I talked to him today. He's, he lives in San Francisco. He's in his uh, sophomore year at University of San Francisco, and he said today the air quality is so bad because of the fires, he hasn't left his house, but he will not miss class tonight because he's a good boy. He, um, so it's, it's interesting because he's not taking after you in that way. Oh, I mean, he doesn't have a choice. <laughs> no, um, Owen is an absolute, like, he's a saint. I mean, he's in his sophomore year at college, and his freshman year at University of San Francisco, he made Dean's List. Um, the kid's a star. He's a wonderful, wonderful boy. I want to come to what people, one aspect of what people know about you, which is when you started to make vlogs. Yeah. And um, there's a date, March 24th, 2015. March 26th. Uh, 26th? Yeah. <laughs> there's a date, March 26th, 2015. Four. No. 2015. It's also my 34th birthday. And I have a big announcement to make. Let me explain. See, I'm 34 years old and I've never had so much going on in my life. I got married like a year ago, uh, had a kid three months ago. My other kid, Owen, he's driving now. Um, I've been traveling a lot with and without the family. Uh, so sorry. I'm also helping my supermodel friend Carly Kloss start a YouTube channel. Casey, I'm not your supermodel friend. I'm just your friend. I'm still spending time at MIT working out of the media lab. I started a new business. And sometimes, but not enough, I'm making movies. I want to make more movies, but there's so much going on in my life, it, it makes it tough. So I've decided, starting today, my 34th birthday, I'm going to make a movie every day. For a while, anyways. Uh, or until I get bored. Where did this idea come from? I mean, so it was multifaceted. So everything I said there is exactly the truth. Like I had, um, I had just left MIT, uh, and for the record, I am, my professor said this, but I don't know if it's fact, but he said that I'm the only uh, MIT fellow who is also a high school dropout. Um, yeah, so suck on that, Trent Alexopoulos. Um, I just left MIT. I had just founded my technology company. Um, everything I said there, and it was just, I, I wasn't making my YouTube, I wasn't doing my happiness, my source of happiness. And beyond that, there was a business concern, which was that I'd always counted on leveraging my social reach because of my YouTube videos. You know, I had 300,000 YouTube subscribers at the time. Leveraging that to talk about my new company when my new company was ready to launch because it was a consumer-facing product that we were building. And so my, my, my social reach was fading because I wasn't making movies and I needed to fix that. So I thought if I started making videos every day, I'd have a, a vehicle to talk about my new company. I'd have a vehicle for sort of creative expression, which is forcing myself to make a movie every day. And it seemed like a really novel idea. Um, it's a kind of a new, a new form of autobiography. Yeah, or reality TV. I mean, at the time, vlogging now is, a, is probably the most popular genre on all of, all of YouTube, but at the time, it was, nobody did it. There were two or three vloggers that, that did it daily, and it was much more of a talking into your cell phone of a journal kind of thing, and I wanted to make a movie every day. But to find that kind of subject matter is very hard, unless you kind of turn the camera on yourself. Every day is a new story, if, if, if you look at your life that way, through that lens. Um, and I thought it'd be a great thing. Like I pictured this like The Office, like the Steve Carell, The Office sort of story about my new company. But like six seconds into the third episode, I was like, this is boring. 
So I needed to go further. And that's when I started bringing in my personal life and like all of these other things and people started responding. And it just, it took off in ways that I could have never imagined. And, you know, I, I started, like I said, with three or 400,000 subscribers and I had done 100 million views on my YouTube channel or 80 million views on my YouTube channel up until that point. And when I stopped the Daily Show uh, a little over two years later, a year and a half later, something like that, I had seven million subscribers and almost two billion views on that YouTube channel. Um, it was a really, it was a really sort of, it was a gigantic inflection point in my, in my career as a filmmaker. Is there a difference between the YouTube Casey Neistat and the real Casey Neistat? Well, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a common question, and the answer is yes. Like, the real Casey Neistat is, is you know, I live a very, I, life is mostly boring. I mean, like, this is interesting right now. If he worked on these questions and he's super smart, and we have microphones on, but like the 15 minutes before coming out here, we're sitting in that room back there eating those chocolates. Not that interesting. <laughs> um, so uh, the point I'm trying to make, poorly trying to make, is just that when you're able to compress 24 hours of a life into seven to nine minutes or 10 minutes, however long my episodes were, it gives you a real opportunity to edit out the boring. But do you, sometimes, do you sometimes worry that um, it can also bring about an what one might call an excessive narcissism? Oh, no, you have to have an excessive narcissism before you even begin making something like a daily <laughs> vlog about your life. That, to me, that is just nothing more than a little bit of window into a pre-existing excessive Condition. narcissism. Yeah, yeah. No, I've had that since birth. <laughs> you know, there's another... Andy Warhol line I love, where he says, it's not what you are that counts, it's what they think you are. Yeah, or there's a better, there's a version of that said by someone else, and it's like, just imagine, just imagine what you want to, I'm, I'm butchering this, but it's like, just imagine what you want to be and be that. And I think it's a more honest or empowering version of that Andy Warhol quote. And for me, that's what it was. It's like, get back to narcissism a little bit. It's like a, a joke that my wife says is that I've always been famous. It's just nobody else knew about it until very recently. <laughs> I've always been extremely, extremely wealthy. I just haven't always had any money. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I decided very early, like I knew, I'm very fortunate in that because of, I think, those early hardships in life, it was vivid for me what I wanted to do. And the precise manifestation obviously had to be malleable, and it was, and it manifested differently, but I knew what I wanted to do and what I wanted to be very early. And one of the things that I always say to young people looking for advice is there's only really two things you should be doing in your life, and that's figuring out what your passion is, what you want to do, and then doing it. And I always say the second part's really easy. The first part is what's hard. Most people never really figure out what it is they want to do because you get distracted. You get a good job, you have kids, you get a sweet car, you get a car payment, you get a pair of golden handcuffs because your job pays you well even though you hate it. All of these things happen and then life takes over. And then those beautiful, magical years, those transformative years, I think like the teenage years where you just obsess about what you want to be and who you are, those fade and reality takes over. And somewhere throughout that transition, you lose sight of what that is that you wanted to do. And I think for me, that big, gross transition, which normally takes 10 or 12 years of someone's life, late teens to early 30s, for me, it was compressed into a matter of months. Moved out of my parents' house as a parent. That all happened in, you know, that happened in like 11 months. And because of that, that passion was so vivid. And that passion was amplified by spending 70 hours a week scrubbing chowder pots at a really shitty seafood restaurant. Um, which is another thing that I always come back to to young people, which is if you don't, if you don't know what you love doing, then, then spend a lot of time doing what you hate. I mean it. Have you ever scrubbed a chowder pot? <laughs> Let me just paint a picture. I'm yeah, gonna spend, this yeah. is a good piece of our time I want to spend on chowder pots right now. But, 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 what are they, first of all? A chowder pot is what you make clam chowder in. Oh, okay. And clam chowder is this thick, creamy, viscous, clam-flavored soup. And the chowder pot is a, it's, you know, like seven gallons, it's deep. And I get it back, and I'm the pot washer. The bottom of it is burned because of the heavy cream. So it soaks in water all day. 
And then you dump out the water and the bottom has this gooey, nasty, clammy, creamy burn on it that you have to scrub off. And when you lean in, it's so deep that the gross day-old chowder goo gets on your shirt right here. And then it just permeates. It, just, it, it, it consumes your being, and that is your smell. <laughs> There's no shaking that smell. That is who you are. And then you scrub. And the scrubbing is so aggressive that it just, it, no matter what you're using, it gets under your fingernails. And you literally, this is not like this is, you literally, that chowder pot becomes part of you. It is physically under your fingernails. It is literally part of you. And that was my existence for like 70, 80 hours a week. Like that is a tough thing. Like when I see dirty pots right now, I'm like, mm-mm. And when, <laughs> when Candace is like, I left you food, you just have to heat it up. I'm like, mm, nope, I'll go hungry. Like I can't, like dirty hands, like touching food. If I see a chowder pot, I will just like drop the floor and start crying, fetal position, <laughs> sucking my thumb. Um, but it, like, my dreams were all born in the bottom of that chowder pot. I mean that, and I never let go of them because I didn't have a choice. It was either realize those or back the chowder pot. I'm going to change gears slightly. No more chowder. No more chowder. No more pots. Um, I wonder if you... <laughs> I didn't even know I was saying that. But anyway, um, I wonder if you, you share the concern that, that Bill Moyers, who's an anchor, expresses in this way. He says, I worry that my own business helps to make this in an anxious age of agitated amnesiacs. We Americans seem to know everything about the last 24 hours, but very little of the last 60 centuries or the last 60 years. What was the question? <laughs> the, the question was if you agree and if you share his concern. I do, but I'm not so quick to attribute the causality. I think that is a... So, it, so speak about the concern. Sure. Speak about the concern. Concern. You, you share the concern. Oh, the concern is, this concern is tremendous. It's that like, we live in a culture, a culture that I'm very much part of, and a culture that I promote, um, although not intentionally. Um, and that culture is one of rapid consumption. I'm literally on a stage right now in front of several hundred people, and I'm talking to one of the most engaging people I've ever spoken with, and I want to check Twitter. And yeah. I, I, I mean that, thank you. I, I, no, but I, I, but I understand. I, I, yeah, so I'm you're being, talking I'm, about the addiction. It, the, it's more than the addiction. It is, a, it is a culture. It is everything from television to being a 24-hour news cycle to the fact that, like, when I was a child, we had one TV, it was 19 inches, to, you know, Trinitron, Sony glass-heavy television in our, our, my parents' house, and now we are just inundated by screens. Like, I'm looking across this room, and I see a couple people's faces illuminated because they're staring at their screens right now. Look up. You'll see two more screens right here. We are just <laughs> constantly looking at screens. Like, and, uh, and so you, you are, in a way, going to the causality. Well, that's, yeah. there's, to me, there's no disassociating the two. It is a symbiotic relationship, a symbiotic relationship like, that, like I said, I'm a part of. I mean, uh, and does that worry you to, that you are a part of it? And that part doesn't worry me okay. because it is an absolute just tidal wave. It is a tsunami that's coming here. So if I want to stand there and with this cup and think I'm going to stop a tsunami and say I will not be a part of this, but you, did tell, but you did tell people just now, look up, you'll see two screens. I keep wondering when I walk down the streets, and again, I'm, I'm a culprit, and I see everybody, you know, davening in the streets, or looking at their screens. I, I wonder, you know, what it is to grow up being 15 today with your head down and not seeing the sky. I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that we're getting to it. Like, this is a much more theoretical conversation than anything else, but uh, or the theoretical we'll, we'll perspective. Get, we'll, we'll get to practical things. Okay. Uh, a much more theoretical perspective, but it's like there's only one of two options. going to continue going in this direction to an end that I don't understand. I'm a pretty big fan of Ready Player One, which is an end that I hope we never realize, if any of you read that book. Um, a book, it's a... It's a uh, a work of science fiction that's in the not too distant future where we all live in a VR world. Um, who, who wrote it? Uh, Klein, right? Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know it, but. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's fine. one end, or there's sort of a pivot that comes out of it. Like we reach a point of saturation and human desire wants more. And I don't 
think that it will be the latter. I think it will be some version of the prior. And the reason why I think that is that my baby daughter, um, it was a remarkable, what I thought of as phenomenon, but it turns out it wasn't a phenomenon at all. My baby daughter, when she was 14 months old, could navigate the YouTube app on a cell phone. She's not special. I mean, she's special, but I mean, in this, <laughs> in this capacity, she's not special. Um, and, you know, like, I consider myself to be a good parent. My wife and I try very hard, and we have the luxury of having, you know, we have help, we have babysitters and things like that. It's not a matter of, like, we, we don't have the energy to give her attention, but in moments of desperation at a restaurant, things like that, you slide your phone in front of a baby, an infant, who's in diapers and can't speak. And, and their ability and, that is, and, their and that is worrisome. And the other part that is worrisome that I'm sure you've experienced is people you think might be connected to each other sitting across from each other at a restaurant. And I always say I, um, I stopped dating, whatever, in like 2009 when I got very serious with my now wife. And thank God, because there is no way that I could date with smartphones. Like, I don't care how engaging the human being is sitting across from me or how much I'm in love with that human being. They're not as interesting to me as whatever might be taking place on my phone. I got to look at it for a minute. And like that's going to be like, those dates are going to end fast. Like I can only excuse myself to the bathroom so many times before they either assume that like I have a very serious cocaine addiction, which I don't. <laughs> or that like I need to check my cell phone, but I am absolutely guilty in that capacity. Like I, I am, I am a, I'm part of the problem, not the solution. But can we go back? You talked about... How do I feel about the fact that I, I am a part of this sort of yes. very ugly? Yeah, and, and so I mean, my feeling on it is this: like, when there's something coming that uh, I think is an inevitability, you can fight it, which is again being that person with a teaspoon trying to stop a tsunami, or you can work within it and do what you think is most effective to be a healthy part of it. And I, I like uh, most of my vlogs are just fun stuff, like me riding my skateboard, goofy things, hanging out with friends, getting to know my family. But when I have something that's important to me, something important to share, whether it's something personal, it's about another person, um, I use this vehicle for that. And I do it without ever any consideration as to whether or not my audience might find it interesting. Um, and it's not always altruistic, but the example I'll give is one that, that certainly has altruistic undertones, but uh, a young girl who I'd never met before got in touch with me, and she is an aspirational and now somewhat successful YouTuber, and she has, she's completely blind. She has, she has no vision whatsoever. And when I got that email, I was fascinated. That just didn't line up for me, so I had her come by, and we made a movie together. And I came up with this on the spot, and I didn't consider it as an interesting movie. I just wanted to know. I was like, I want you to truly blindfold me, and then let's spend the day together. And I want to know. And I made it 10 minutes. I mean, it went a while, but I made it 10 minutes before I completely freaked out because I, I stopped realizing that I could tear it off, and I owned it. And when we stepped outside the door, and her guide dog's guiding both of us, like a, a panic overcame me. And I tried my best to capture as much of that as I could, which is one one morsel of it, one percent of that in a video and share that with my audience. And like as my, the teenagers who like to watch me skateboard gonna be interested in what it's like to be like entirely visually impaired? I don't know, because I don't care. It's possible. No, but, it's possible. Uh, no, but, but I think you probably do care insofar that you would like those teenagers who uh -oh. watch what you do for fun also to perhaps be interested in what it might that, feel that's like. That's exactly right. When I say I don't care, I mean, part of my decision-making process and do I release this or not, it doesn't even come on the spectrum of will people be interested in this. I was interested in it. It was the most, one of the most moving experiences of my life, spending this day with this girl, and I, was, I felt obliged to share that. So if in some capacity that can be like that tidal wave that's coming, there's like a, a little glimmer in there of something that is maybe opening folks' eyes to something that they had never experienced before, as I had never experienced before, so in many ways, I mean, this is a, um, an opening in, in what is possible for Casey Neistat to do in the future. Because in many ways, you, you could do an action like that repeatedly. Put people, try as much as you can, put people in a situation such as a situation of blindness and give them as much as you can a true feeling of it. Even uh, absolutely. And I guess the point that I was slowly... Yeah, 
trying to come to is that like this, this started with the question about sort of this inability to pay attention to anything that isn't right now and right this second. Last 24. Last 24 hours. And uh, I, I subscribe to that because I, my attention span is ever fleeting as is uh, all, I think all of societies is ever fleeting. Attention and is Do clear. you resist that or do you embrace that? And as a, as a person with influence, I choose to embrace that. And I choose to embrace that by leveraging what influence I do have to share things that I think matter in a way that fits into that rapid consumption model um, that typically is averse to what I see as the more, um, let me say it in a less, let me say it without trying to sound smart. A lot of the content that populates that 24 hour consumption cycle is not always the most engaging, um, is not always the smartest or the most, it doesn't always matter. A lot, it's a lot more like junk food. Um, it's not a delicious meal served every 24 hours. It's a bag of Doritos. And I think our compulsion enables us to always reach for the Doritos instead of trying to find something that's better. I always watch YouTube on my phone no matter what amazing movie is, could be on the gigantic television in front of me. That, the big TV, an amazing movie is better than whatever garbage I'm watching on my phone. But for whatever reason, like, the Doritos always taste better. And I want to make something that people are willing to watch or consume the way they are Doritos, but, but have it maybe have some impact. Speak about this film. So that, that's a movie called Little Dieter Needs to Fly. It's a documentary by Werner Herzog, my, my favorite filmmaker. The joke earlier that I thought you were Werner when you called me is you guys sound exactly alike. Um, maybe Pe not a joke. People have more said. sense. Yeah. Um, so Dieter Dangler's story, that guy's story, and you should see the movie, but I'll, I'll give it in the most abbreviated form. Young boy in Germany during World War II and his uh, the town where he was from was being absolutely decimated by uh, American airplanes, American bombers and dive bombers. And uh, he watched a, uh, I think it was a P-51 American fighter plane fly by his house like this and he was able to see the whites in the pilot's eyes. And in that moment, this is as Dieter explains it, um, in that moment he found his passion um, and it was to fly. It's all he wanted to do. Little Dieter needed to fly, and he would stop at nothing to do that. So he figured out how to escape what was then a completely destroyed former Nazi Germany. He made it to the United States. He, he enlisted in the, in the military, in the U.S. Air Force, because he knew that was the only way he could get to a plane. He was a poor kid with nothing. And he fought his way through, and he became a pilot. He got to fly. So but he found they, his passion. He found, well, he had found his passion as yeah. a young boy, yeah. but he had realized his passion in the U.S. Air Force. So they immediately sent him to Vietnam. And on his very first sortie, his very first flight, his plane was shot down. And he was stuck behind en enemy lines in the very, very, very worst of circumstances, where he saw his best friend killed. He was forced to eat maggots to stay alive. He ran from people um, who were trying to kill him actively every single day. And he was in the jungle for years before he was rescued. Um, and when he was rescued, just as an aside, they pulled him up, and he was this decimated man. They had no idea that he was an American. They, they got him into the helicopter, and they're checking all of his stuff, and they dumped out his bag, and in his bag was a snake, like a, a huge fucking Vietnamese snake that he had taken a bite out of because he caught a live snake and took a bite out of the middle of it, and that was the level of hunger that he had. Um, he ended up going back to the States, and he was a hero and all that. He continued to fly. He was in several more plane crashes before his death, which was just a couple of years ago. And this scene here that opens the movie um, is him walking through the house where he lived in the Pacific Northwest. And that was an interesting part where he's opening the door, but he also shows in his basement where he has 50 gallon barrels of sugar, sugar. and flour and other foods to, survive in to case. make sure he'll never be hungry again. And that was the level that do, he went through. Do you know the story about that door? I don't remember. I'm, I'm going to read to you what Werner Herzog says Please. about it. It's, it's Do your super. best Werner Her voice. Do you want me to? Do you have to try? Is there a Everything in this film is authentic. <laughs> no. Everything in this film is authentic, Dieter. But to intensify him, some of the stories were scripted, rehearsed and carefully orchestrated. It was my job as director to translate and edit his thoughts into something profound and cinematic, which meant trimming away everything that didn't fit however interesting. So he had Dieter open the door again and again and again. And wasn't, you know, he, he did it for cinematic reasons. 
And I think that, that in some sense can change the way one feels about it. I know, not me. I'm a, a huge subscriber. I mean, I treat this as religion, but never let, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. And that's where the, that's where the quotation starts. I, I think of it much more as like, um, your primary job is to tell the story as effectively as possible. Everything about Dieter Dangler was real. And how do you, as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, illustrate the profundity that was the impact of him being a, a prisoner for so many years? And that door was a very, very, very real, very literal no. illustration of that. So was it a lie? Well, no, Werner asked him to do it? talks very interestingly about the ecstatic truths. Yeah, I, I, I don't subscribe to that. I really don't. And this, this dovetails with what you were asking earlier about is the version of Casey in the vlog the real version? Yes. It's just not the whole version. Um, there's so much more to life than what can be shared in, in seven to nine minutes. This is, Dieter Dengler was in his 60s when Werner made the movie about him. Um, and he was telling the, the entire scope of a human being's life, 60 years. And he told that story in, you know, he told the story in 110 minutes. So whatever, you as a filmmaker, you as a storyteller, have an obligation to tell that story in the most effective way possible. And I don't think Werner telling him to open up the door like that affects any of the truths of that movie whatsoever. Um, but I do understand why you're asking this question. I think that's a divisive perspective. I want to ask you about the film I have not seen, The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp. Yeah, so Life and Death of Colonel Blimp was a movie... Um, my facts are a little shady here because I've haven't, I haven't, I've never actually researched the movie, although I've seen it a few dozen times. But it's a movie that was made during the war, and it was made in England. But somehow they found the resources to make a movie. That is one of the factors that to me is just so exciting. I've always described my filmmaking style not by choice, but by, uh, by default as minimal resource filmmaking. I didn't have equipment. I had no resources. So what could I do with that? This is the best I could come up with. And that movie is such, is such a gigantic example of having no resources. On top of that, from a narrative perspective, the movie starts and it's, it's, um, it's the hero of the movie and he's an old man, he's an old fat man. And he's attacked by a younger man and being judged by a younger man. And he says, you see this mustache, but you don't know why I have it. You see this stomach, but you don't know why I look like this. You see this man, but you don't know what it represents. And it goes back to the beginning of his life and it carries you through his life. I love stories that transcend that much time a through a single person's perspective. And then the last factor is it literally, the movie was made in 1943, I believe. It literally looks like a Wes Anderson movie that, that I was just he released to this you. week. Um, yeah. And Wes Anderson would be the first to tell you how much he learned from that movie. But it's little things, like the opening title sequence of this movie was literally a gigantic tapestry and all of the credits were sewn into the tapestry and the camera moves in and moves out and you're reading it off the tapestry. So that kind of, that kind of handcraftedness I just absolutely adore. What did, what did you, if I had to ask you this question, yeah. what did you learn from Wes Anderson? <sighs> you know, I saw Bottle Rockets when I was like 17 years old and to me it was just, it was, it was the most fun version of storytelling and uh, uh, obsessing on the weirdness. Um, you know, there's a shot in Bottle Rockets where they break into his, his parents' house and he goes into his own bedroom and accidentally knocks over. I don't know if he accidentally knocks over, but he stands up, one of his little, like, um, pewter soldiers. And the shot of him standing that up is the most unnecessarily perfect shot you've And I've never seen that in cinema before. I'd never seen that in cinema before. And I think that's what's come to sort of define Wes Anderson's style is this, this kind of, uh, every shot looks like it could be a, a, a painting of some sort. And not in like the, you know, not in the Stanley Kubrick way, um, not in the, the Barry Lyndon way, but in a, in a way that felt so much more accessible. And that is something that really excited me. In fact, one of the first movies that I ever made that was successful, I made it with my brother Dan, it's called Science Experiments. And we made it in the bedroom of my apartment. And we bought Mr. Wizard's World Science Experiments at Home was the book. And we just like, we're like, which ones will be cinematic? And we're like, okay, this, go buy some mothballs and vinegar, which, by the way, if you take mothballs, sand them down with a 110 sandpaper, fill up a jar with vinegar, drop the mothballs in it, they all sink to the bottom. Then bubbles start to form on them. The mothballs rise to the top. When they reach the top, those bubbles burst, they drop to the bottom and repeat. So if you film that and then speed it up a little bit, you look at this clear jar with the clear liquid in it, and mothballs, the moth, mothballs are dancing. 
It's beautiful. That was one of the first movies we made. And the, the, the cinematic nature of that movie, the cinematography is very Wes Anderson-like. We just didn't have, like, you know, we didn't have Luke or Owen Wilson to be in it, so we used mothballs. <laughs> <laughs> but also, the graphics in your, in your vlog seem to, to have a Wes Anderson quality to them. Yeah, there's, there's so a lot much... Of, a lot of resonance and echo. Yeah, I, I think that there's a weird accessibility to the perfection that is his movies. There's an accessibility to the, the, the perfectionist that you can see behind them. I want to take us into some of perhaps what one might call your weirdness um, and, and, look, and, look, at the, and um, look at video number five. This here is for painting equipment. My painting supplies get really out of control when I'm in the middle of painting something. So I think it was two summers ago now I had an intern last summer. I had an intern design a, a painting shelf that incorporated all of my painting tools. And it took me the entire summer to build it because I had them rebuild it maybe 20 times. The thing that drives me nuts is this angle bracket used for this shelf here. This should not be an angle bracket. It should be a corner bracket like this. Angle brackets bend. And that's why this isn't a right angle. Corner brackets will never bend. This is the appropriately named wireless setup. If something doesn't work, you need to follow a cable. If it's a rat's nest of cables, it's very hard to follow. But if it's laid out like this, it makes it much easier to follow. So while it's pretty to look at, it's also, it serves a function having, it, having your wires and cables organized like this. And this is something that you try to maintain throughout the entire studio. I didn't make that video, by the way. Cinematography sucked, but yeah, the point is well illustrated. Um, yeah, so that's I, my. That's I, like I a love. I love that moment with the bracket that is off. I, it, yeah, that assistant was fired. Yeah, he, he was let go. Um, not just because of the corner bracket, but I mean, how do you possibly think an angle bracket is appropriate for a shelf? <laughs> it's a weight-bearing shelf. It's gonna bend. There's no structure. No structural integrity to it. But I, I love the compulsive, obsessive quality of, of that whole film that shows this universe you've created for yourself. Yeah, and my studio is very special to me, and that, that video actually doesn't illustrate... Does not. The, it, it does, and it's in its 20-minute yeah, version, yeah. but just how impactful my studio is a box that I got when I was you know, 15 years ago, and it, it's been just iteration after iteration. I describe my, my physical studio as it's, it's more like fashion than it is anything else, and that it's, it's never done. It's just always being improved upon. Um, that entire painting setup was completely disassembled. Couldn't stare at that fucking angle bracket anymore. <laughs> um, but I took all that down, and now there's something else in its place, and it's constantly changing, but I, I sort of have a... a like a, a, a manifesto that guides what that place needs to look like and feel like at all times. And, you know, nothing can be hidden, so there's no shelves or, or stuff with stuff behind that stuff that you can't see. Everything has to be visible. So if anything's hidden, that's where things go to die, and storage in New York City is just not practical. You know, a, a French critic once said, tell me how you classify, and I will tell you who you are. And the... The system of classification there seems so extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, it, it's all rooted in a single mission. And the mission of that studio is to remove as many obstructions between me and making whatever it is I want to make, whether it's a new shelf or a new movie, as possible. If I have to spend time looking for something, it's a failure of the, of the studio. Do you hate disorder? Oh, I hate disorder. Oh, I hate it. Yeah, we were given a tour of the library before we came up here, and while the um, gentleman whose name is escaping me was sort of walking us through these amazing first edition books, I was literally correcting the angle at which he had placed them on the table. You know, I saw that. I didn't want to offend him. Yeah. <laughs> so there is an, an obsessive quality. With an exception that's, that's um, I don't find interesting, but I think what has been told is, my apartment where I live, all I care about is that it's clean. I don't care about anything else. Like, my wife designs it. She picked the wallpaper. Like, I don't, I, and I don't even care. 
Like, it was just like, I had an auto reply on my email that was like, that sounds so great, honey, can't wait to see it. And no matter what she would send me, that would just, boom, right back to her. Um, <laughs> well, it's also, it simplifies life. Um, it, yeah, and it's it, because, like, I can't bring, I don't have that energy in my home. My home is a place where I want to be with my family and I want to sleep. And I don't have any desire for that kind of madness or structure in my home. It's just not, it doesn't matter to me. All I care is that it's clean. Having you here, um, I would be remiss not to ask you a little bit about, about influencer marketing, which is something that I've, I've um, learned a lot about by preparing to speak with you. And I was amazed to read some of these statistics in an article in a magazine I wouldn't necessarily usually read. Is influencer marketing 2017's most trendy trend from Marketing Insider Group February 2017? And they say this, the most powerful trend in marketing right now, it would be influencer marketing, is providing 960% return on investment. One of the most thorough studies on the ROI, return on investment, of using influencers was done by Tap Influence and Nielsen Catalina Solutions. They followed the marketing efforts of a Fortune 500 food company. Here are the results. Influencer marketing yields an annual ROI of $23 compared to 4.30 cents of the brand's best performing banner ads. For every thousand views, influencing brought in $285 in incremental sales. Influencer campaigns brought in 11 times the ROI of traditional advertising over the course of the year. It's interesting, and you're yeah. definitely part of it. And maybe one question to ask you is, how do you decide who you work with in that? Well, I'm also I'm very dismissive of it. I think the word um, influencer is a, like a really grotesque descriptor, because um, you're taking someone who's essentially a, a creative individual. You're taking a filmmaker, you're taking a content creator, and you're, you're reducing them to the effect of what their creations do. It'd be like, you know, calling Elvis Presley an, like an, an ear pleaser. <laughs> I listen to his music and it pleases my ears instead of referring to him to what he is, which is a musician. So, one, I'm very dismissive of that word, but let's, we, can, we can put that in a box and, and get to your question. Influences is, is, is the most powerful thing, and it always has been. And I think the difference, the shift that we've seen that those... Um, statistics. statistics represent are the shift from influence um, from being those from being a few to many from being owned by the powers that be to being made truly egalitarianized has been a shift that happened so rapidly that whatever knucklehead made that study in that absurd magazine that you just listed they're reacting to it in trying to understand what's taking place so when it comes to working with brands you're typically working with agencies and, uh, and, and marketers and advertisers who have next to zero understanding of this powerful thing called influence um, because that's, that was not the norm when they were being taught it. I don't, but, but, they, but they do hire you. Absolutely. Because, and, and when because, I say they don't understand it, I don't mean that in a patronizing way. No, no, no. I mean I'm, that objectively. But they hire you because they know something about Casey Neistat's ability to inspire other people to want something is very strong. Sure, which is why I only really work with brands that I have a firm belief in, a firm uh, conviction in. Like Nike, whether you like their shoes or not, they've come to represent Just Do It, which is an attitude I love, an attitude that I, I subscribe to. Um, you know, the only brand that I really work with right now is Samsung. I think Samsung makes great products, but I carry an iPhone and a Samsung phone. I think a lot of companies make great products, but Samsung has made this really, really strong effort to enable and support the YouTube creator community. And that's something that I really subscribe to and something that I can get behind. So it enables me to speak authentically because I genuinely believe in what this company is doing or trying to do. Can I be a part of that? Yes. Now, if a tampon company were to approach me, even if they were the very best tampons, 
I have very little relationship with feminine hygiene products. And I would have no idea how to leverage my influence to market them. But I sure as shit understand this. I shoot half my videos on this. So I can talk about this in an authentic way. So when it comes to finding the brands um, to work with, to me, it, there has to be truth there first. Otherwise, I can't speak to that truth. But for me, leveraging influence um, in a monetizable way is, is much less about what brands to work with and much more about sort of the inventive opportunities that that creates. Um, I think that my technology company is a very literal example of that. Like, I think my technology company was successful and ultimately successful in that we were acquired um, at a profit. And you like, want to say something about that? Which part? About this new... Yeah, I'm this, more than happy to get into yeah. it, but you know, it, was a, it was a fairly narrow technology product. It was acquired by a media company for a lot of money, and it was a very successful endeavor. And I attribute certainly some of that to the product that we had built. But I think a lot more of that was enabled because of the influence of my vlog. I think, I, I can, for a fact, I would not have been in the room with, the, the per, with Jeff Zucker, the CEO of CNN. I wouldn't have been in that room had it not been for my vlog. I mean, his, the, the irony of CNN acquiring my company is that meeting was for one reason. It was because Jeff's kids spoke so highly of my YouTube videos that they said, you have to meet this guy. And I was flattered by being, uh, you know, courted by Jeff Zucker. And I walk into his office, and his kids are there asking for selfies. And I was like, what, Jeff, what's going on here? Um, and, but it was ultimately that interaction that led to an acquisition that has now led to us building a business together. We have, um, you know, almost 35 employees, and we're, you know... And what are you building? Sure. So, you know, my technology company was very, fairly narrow in its scope. It was a mobile sort of peer-to-peer -peer video sharing app. Um, and then towards the end, we started building other apps. But what the company became when CNN bought it was first whatever I wanted it to become, which is part of the reason why I was so excited about working with them. And when I sat down with my partner and I sat down with my team and conversations began about what we could do, we got very excited about merging the two things that, that we had by default came to be known for, which is my understanding of YouTube, media, and then technology. So we wanted to build a new company that was about embracing technology and embracing media. And because we had the resources of CNN, let's make it about news. And that's what we're trying to build now. And we are, you know, 11 months into uh, what is a company that's wholly owned by CNN and its parent company, Turner, but what operates exactly like a startup. Um, we all have passes into Turner's, like, 9,000-story glass tower in Midtown, but our offices are in Chinatown literally in the basement of a former furniture shop. Like, that's where we work. Um, and it's just a bunch of sort of ragtag individuals coming together trying to solve problems. It is a startup environment. Um, and the company's building. It's finding its roots, finding its footing. We're making content that I think is meaningful and matters. We're building technology that enables and supports that, that content. And the content is, will be based on news? Yeah, I mean, you need a nail to hang the hat on, and that first nail that we punched in the wall was news. So how do you make YouTube, video about, YouTube videos about news and things that are relevant and happening that maybe people want to know more of? Well, we do it because we have a lot of the resources of CNN, so we can send somebody to the, you know, to the middle of the Virgin Islands two days after they're hit by Hurricane Irma and say, like, Lindsay, tell us what you see there. And then we can make a YouTube video about that. And that's very exciting because nobody in the YouTube community has those kinds of resources, so that's exciting. And then we want to make it so people can contribute. So then we have the chops to build a mobile app. And we build a mobile app called Panels, because panels on broadcast news are the most boring thing, where it's a bunch of old, typically white, gray-haired men pontificating about some political thing that they understand that you don't. And that doesn't mean anything to me. So we build a product called Panels, where anybody can chime in on a subject matter that we prompt them with and give us their two cents. And you can see that and see thousands of people from around the world as you're cycling through, give their opinion on something. And we can pluck content from that and put it in our show. So instead of it being old men, you're seeing peers like you from around the world sharing their diverse opinions around a specific subject that we're trying to express our opinions on via our, our, the content that we're making. That sounds much like more confident than our company currently is. We're very young and we're figuring things out. I mean it. But I think that... that We've realized everything that I've just said, but only now are we sort of finally going from treading water to standing on something that's a little bit more firm in finding our footing as a company. I want to show you something uh, from the past. 
um, a little moment of Marshall McLuhan talking. Oh, please. It's quite interesting. It's uh, video number nine. One last point for me. You've said that advertising is the uh, folk art of the 20th century. In what sense is it an art? An art? I, I think it is a, a very great art form. It's not a private art form. It's corporate. Um, but it is... Uh, it, the concern of the um, advertiser is to make an effect. The, any painter, uh, any, any artist, any musician sets out to create an effect. He sets a trap to catch somebody's attention. Any painter, any poet, any musician sets a trap for your attention. That is the nature of art. Do you think there are any masterpieces of advertising or radio or television in the sense that there are we'll know better, masterpieces? We'll know better in, what, 50 years? It's interesting, no? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's what he said there is more true now than it was then. But he also talks about the trap. And, you know, there's a way in which sometimes we don't quite realize what, what we're being sold. Well, I think that that's a sort of an, I don't, I didn't take, I didn't get that. Yeah. I, I think there's truth to what you're saying, yeah. but I think in hearing him use the word trap, I see it's an attention trap is what he described it as. And, you know, you walk through an art museum, the, the painting that makes you stop and stare at, that's an effective attention trap. The YouTube video that you don't scroll past, that you click on, that's a good attention trap. Um, that Apple commercial was a fantastic attention trap. It's 20 years old. We're talking about it right now. So I, I don't necessarily attach any sort of specific negative connotations to that. Um, but I, although I think there are, I think there's more nefarious usage for creativity that has a sole purpose of selling you something that you don't want or need. Um, excuse me, but again, I think that the, the spectrum is so broad there. And the temptation to lump everything over here, lump everything over here is a very dangerous one. Um, and I think it's finding where you are as a creative individual on that spectrum, what your comfort level is. Um, that's primary. I want to show something that um, is of a different nature and really hear who you think your audience is for this. If we could show clip number seven. When I think of the greatest days in my entire life, I think of when my children were born, or perhaps when my son graduated high school, or today, when I was upgraded from business to first on Emirates. I don't know what I did to deserve this. I really don't. Oh my god. Snacks? Writing kit? We're in the air. Just left Dubai. I got my own doors. It's like my own little house over here. privacy. So, I mean, that movie, um, for the person out there who hasn't seen that, uh, that movie I made because I was flying home from uh, Australia and I was upgraded to first class and it was one of the, like I said, one of the highlights of my entire life. <laughs> but first class meant privacy and you're not allowed to film on planes. I had all my camera gear with me, so I like, literally was using professional level gear and tripods in the airplane because nobody could see me. So I was able to shoot this movie that I thought was funny, and I edited it on the plane before I landed, and I posted it the next morning. And 40 million people saw it or something yeah, like yeah, it's that. Yeah, like 48 million 48 people million. saw that movie. Like, and that's like... That's pretty like, good ad for... Uh, I mean, the irony of that is like Ad Week, it was Ad Week or one of those Ad Something magazines named it the best... Um, branded content commercial of the year, and I had to literally call them and be like, I wasn't, it wasn't an ad. I wasn't paid for that. Um, but this is where it becomes... This, this is where it becomes great. Like, I, was, I even say in the video, there's text on screen that says, I was not hired or paid, and this is not an official Emirates video because I didn't want to get in trouble from Emirates. Um, they loved it, though. Uh, but no, and like I, I remade that movie two days ago. I found myself I had another 14-hour yeah. flight, and I was like, I'm making that movie again. Different airline. Um, 
But no, it, that's a movie where I could, in my wildest dreams, have not a guess that, that would be the one that would do 45 million views. But then, who are the, you know, because then 48 million people see it, so you must begin thinking, why? And I think, to some extent... That's a dangerous path. Okay, let's, let's be dangerous. I don't for mean for this conversation. No, I mean, no. as, as a creator, if you look at your successes and say, okay, I need to make more of that. No, I'm not even saying okay, that. Okay. I'm what saying that the there's something saying? on the level of deep fantasy. You know, there I am in first class on that airline, which becomes aspirational for other people. Aspirational are people just hate me because I'm doing it and they're not, which I get a lot of. Well, you must. You, you must create an extraordinary amount of envy. Yeah. Do you guys know the difference between envy and jealousy? Why is envy a deadly sin and jealousy is not? Seriously, not one person in this entire room of intellectuals? No, they're, right they're, they're just being shy. Okay. Tell us. To be jealous means that I want what you have. Um, to envy means I want what you have and I don't want you to have it. And that's why jealousy is okay. Jealousy is great. Um, but envy is a, is a, is a bad thing. Um, and I think that YouTube commenters are typically more envious than jealous. But, uh, but a video like that, I think the reason why it was so widespread is like, I think it was a perfect storm of things. I think it was like, one, that's really interesting. Like before I was on that plane, I didn't know planes existed that have showers on them. And you have doors that are electronic. Like, I didn't know that existed. And I think the vast majority of people's exposure to airlines are seeing a, a blurry cell phone clip of somebody being dragged off a United flight or, <laughs> or being shuffled onto a Southwest plane where like you get your 22 inches and you just like try not to breathe too deep for the next six hours of cramped legs. My enthusiasm in that video was not artificial at all. Um, you know, I, one of the, I do a you lot You were of, giddy. Yeah, like I'm, I'm gonna, I'm like a grown ass man with two kids who's like has a good career, I make a good living. And I still like every day I'm shocked by the opportunities and experiences that I have. Um, I was like driving my car today, it's my car. It's like a, like a SUV or whatever, but it's like the first new car I've ever had. And the whole time I'm driving, I've had the car for a while. I'm like, can you believe how nice this car is? It's like, it's my car, it's not a big deal. I'm like talking to my wife, she's like, I know Casey. <laughs> I drive it, it's like a car. Like, I'm never, being surprised at the things that I get to experience in life will never go away for me. Um, and it's because, like, I firmly believe that we all have a point in life where we stop growing, like a, a, a moment of kind of arrested development in, our, in who we identify as. You know, Eminem was in the news right now for his rant last night, but Eminem... What do you well, think of that? Uh, that, um, that is a long, one-way street with a dead end at the end. And I don't know we, we want to go down that road. I'm a huge Eminem fan. But I think, like, Eminem sort of, his arrested development began when he was that, like, struggling Detroit white kid who wanted to serve, succeed in an industry where he didn't belong. And for me, I will never not be that guy who lives in a trailer park who scrubs chowder pots. I will always be that guy. So when I get to be in that fucking airplane, of course I'm going to freak out. It had two doors. And like I, like, I couldn't sit there and be like, oh, this is fine. More caviar. Like, I don't, like, <laughs> that's just not me. I don't have access to that. I never will. Um, you know, I fly internationally two times a month, and it's always for work, so I always get put in, like, the fancy seat every time I'm excited. Every time I'm like, I'm like, excuse me, ma'am, 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 ma'am. She got the blankets. And she's like, don't talk to me. Um, like, I'm never not excited by these things. It's always like, bl I still say to my wife, I'm like, can you believe we live in New York City? And she's like, you have to stop saying that. <laughs> um, so no, my enthusiasm is never artificial. I'm just in a permanent state of shock that I get to access this shit. It's, it just blows my mind. And I think that's something that, that spoke to people about that video. Is it's not like seeing a guy get to fly, it's like, Getting to see like how I would react if I got to fly in that like absurd, you know, fancy hotel in the sky. I think that that relatability is something that's important. I want to talk about a, a, a recent controversy, a YouTube controversy. If we can look at image two. Oh yeah. Yeah, you want me to walk? I, so let me walk. Do you have Phil? Do you have the next tweet? Okay, so here's what, I don't. Here's what, here's what, transpired. Here's what, here's what happened. Yeah, but 
because I'd like to understand. Yeah, yeah. So I, I can explain this in very simple terms. But I, 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 whenever I can, I leverage my YouTube channel when I see opportunities to to do good things. And after the the um, mass shooting in Las Vegas, uh, I did a little fundraiser on my YouTube channel, and I announced it in a video of me talking to camera, nothing else about this fundraiser. Um, I posted that video, and in that video, I said, all the money that this video raises from its ads, I'll also donate to this fundraiser, which would be several thousand dollars. And YouTube gave me a strike that you see in this that middle box there, that long rectangle, that piss-colored circle next to the tiny globe there in the middle, means that that movie won't make any money. Um, I posted that online with that tweet saying, literally a video about charity where I state all AdSense is going to charity. YouTube says not suitable for advertisers. They came back and said, Are, you know, no ads about videos about tragedies. And there's certainly an argument there to be like, that's not a video about a tragedy. It's a video about a fundraiser. I don't talk about the tragedy in violent terms or in graphic terms. I purely talk about the fundraiser. Regardless, um, uh, another YouTuber friend of mine from the community named Phil, Phil DeFranco, he... Uh, he took a picture of all of that, and then he posted next to it a, a, a screenshot of another YouTube video posted by Jimmy Kimmel, and the title of the video was um, Discussing the Mass Shooting in Las Vegas. But you don't see Jimmy Kimmel, you see a GMC ad. In the lower left-hand corner, it says ad. And he, Phil posted those two tweets side by side and saying, this is bullshit, YouTube. Why did they get special treatment? And that was... Uh, retweeted like 130,000 times. Uh, and I think that those gross numbers of engagement around that tweet means that like the sort of hypocrisy and frustration that the creator community has towards YouTube was very literally represented in this very brief exchange here where um, these bigger sort of more mainstream outlets are given preferential treatment over the community. And I think that's particularly hurtful to the community because the community really sees themselves as the reason for YouTube's success, which I do think there's a lot of truth to. Um, obviously, I'm not speaking about myself personally, but the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who have dedicated their lives to being creators on this platform and still being treated like second-class citizens. And I think that this very literal example right here um, triggered something. And this was a gigantic news story. A gigantic, and, and it will continue. I mean, well, this YouTube story will... Announced, YouTube announced yesterday that they are going to be... I think they're, the exact verbiage may have been we're looking into correcting that. But um, certainly how I read it, how it was interpreted broadly, was that they're going to be changing their policy to make sure it's equal now across the board. Meaning that this campaign, which was a total of two tweets um, that was then engaged millions and millions of times, did have an effect that will now change a policy, um, which I, speaks to, I think then speaks to the, the more promising effects of, of leveraging influence in a way that, that benefits others. Coming, 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 coming back to, um, to the media company in some way that you're creating, you've said that young people see the media as broken and that they have a better bullshit detector. Um, <laughs> do you really believe that? Oh, 100%. 100%. I think how so? I think how so and how, how has it developed to be a better bullshit detector? It, it comes back to that inundation of content that I was referring to earlier. I'm 36. When I was a kid, I had two channels, Nickelodeon and MTV. That was it. I watched whatever was put in front of me. Real World Season 4, I think, was my favorite. No matter what was on, I had to watch it. I had no other choice, so I'd consume the commercials. Today, we are just constantly watching content. That girl right there is staring at her phone right now. You. And, <laughs> and because of that... And the person next to her also. <laughs> because of that, we've, just, we've become so sensitive to what we're seeing and seeing it for what it is. Or desensitized. Well, uh, I mean, there's, a, there's sure. Still... I mean, there's a there's a mul there's a, a multitude of ways you could look at this, but referring to exactly my statement yeah. of people seeing news media as broken, is uh, they they become so 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 hypersensitive to what they're seeing that when something reeks of bullshit or feels phony or feels fake or feels not real in any capacity, our sensitivity to that one is triggered much more quickly, and two, the opportunities to get away from it are real. 
When I was a kid, I could then change it to Nickelodeon. That was my only option. When I would watch my, uh, he's now 19, but I would watch Owen when he was 13, 12 years old, in front of the computer, his behavior, which I would study. He'd play a YouTube video. A five-second pre-roll would begin. Apple, T, open a new tab, F, enter, Facebook. All that in under one second. I mean, it's probably under a fraction of a second, but boom, Facebook's open. Commercial's playing in another screen that he doesn't see because it's blocked by this new tab. He's scrolling through Facebook, reading stuff. 4.9 seconds later, shift one, the new window opens. His bullshit sensor went off. He changed the page. He let it play. It never entered into anything he was seeing. He wasn't watching it. He was reading something else. He went back to it, then watched the content he wanted to see. And all of that was a, was a, was, were physical, conscious actions that he didn't even know he was doing. And then that the is other, the bullshit the, sensor yeah. being triggered and his mechanism getting around and it. And then there's the other side, to, to take the other side, which is what is happening to our ability to be attentive? Yeah, but I, again, like I think that that, uh, yes, you're not wrong to bring that up, but I, I see that as kind of a digression to the point that I'm sort of getting at, which is this broken, where I see young people seeing media as broken. TV still subscribes to that rigidity, that rigidity. It's slow moving, it's slow to change. Um, I can tell you my 19-year-old son doesn't watch television. He doesn't at all. None of his peers watch television because they lack, uh, there's a lack of agency when you're watching television. Because they don't watch television, their only exposure to it is in appropriate clips that they might find online. We're seeing our politicians scream loudly about how everything that's on television is fake. I think it is an amalgam of all these factors that have led to that disconnect and that mistrust with what they're seeing and it being broken. Are you sometimes worried by the fact that in our day and age now it would seem that people put their lives in the public sphere at all times so that in some way they, the privacy, their privacy has been inundated by their own volition? Yeah, and again, I have a very sort of a borderline nihilistic view on that, which is just that I see that also as a tidal wave. I think privacy is a thing of the past. And if you think you can... That's think, terrifying. I think it's a reality. And like, I remember recently like, you know, taking a picture of my daughter on the playground and some woman being like, you can see my kid in the background, can you delete that? And I was like, you know, of course, I apologize. And I deleted it. And what's going through my head is like, fucking knucklehead. Do you have any idea how many times your, your picture was taken between here and your apartment? Do you have any idea how many surveillance cameras were in the coffee shop where you went and got your kid that donut? Like, you are constantly being surveilled. Photos are constantly being taken of you all the time. I guarantee you there are surveillance cameras in this room. This is a fucking library. Like, they are everywhere all the time. There's no getting away from that. My gym, I go to my gym, they have to scan in my thumb to walk into a gym. Like, it's a thing of the past. Apple's about to launch a new product that scans the, your face with, like, a thousand dots with such accuracy that the, the chances of it misscanning is one in a million. Like, privacy is fading, and we're trading that for something that I think is meaningful, which is, like, you know, convenience, which is uh, all of these factors that I do think are good. Are they better? I have no idea. But I don't see that shift changing at all. When was the last time you tried to get on an airplane? They look at you completely naked, and if they still don't trust what they're seeing of you completely naked, they physically touch you. Like, it's, it's over. So for someone to sort of leverage that and be willing to sort of share their identity in a way that I think to an older generation like myself seems entirely foreign, I think it's I, a new I, I see it sometimes, you know, with my own children. I see sometimes, you know, the, the ability for them to see what everybody is doing. And it can create also a sense of I'm not doing that. You know so much about, about other people's lives. You know, Jaren Lanier, um, someone I had on this stage some years back, uh, wrote a book called You Are Not a Gadget, where he says young people announce every detail of their lives on services like Twitter, not to show off, but to avoid the closed door at bedtime, the empty room, the screaming vacuum of an isolated mind. Yeah, I think there's... And I think there's tremendous truth to that. But that, that, because when you say it's a thing of the past, we can perhaps laugh at it or, or say it's a thing of the past, but there's something, Casey, there's something worrisome about that. No, please. Yeah, absolutely. But I also think there's something positive to that. Yes. But let's, I, l yes. I'm not speaking to either one, but I mean that, you know, again, look at YouTube as a case study and think of all those lonely, you know, today is, um, what is it, come, what's it? 
National Coming Out Day. And when I think of coming out, um, coming out of the closet, expressing that, you know, your, your, your preference. And when I think of what YouTube has done for young people, because they're able to see people that look just like them come out in a screen that looks just like theirs, in a bedroom that looks like theirs. When I see young people, why are they so engaged with YouTubers like, like me and the myriad other YouTubers sharing their lives? It's because there is a kind of loneliness there. And how did that loneliness, how is that loneliness righted for someone like me when I was a kid? I don't know, it was like through mischief and other things like that. I think what's filled that void now is the fact that people who, young people who feel alone can now access others through social media. And I, I say that, I don't mean to make that sound so positive. No, and the big question is, do they feel less? And I yeah. think there's tremendous dangers there as well. But I do think that's one sliver of positivity. And I'd like to think as we move forward and the, the scales tip a little bit, that the good that comes from all of this like incessant sharing and living our lives so publicly, the good will continue to grow along with the bad and maybe even overcome the bad. Although, if I had to bet, I would say that it, it I think that it's a, a bit of a toss up. I'm, I'm very scared um, for, for what technology is going to do for us as, as human beings uh, in the future. I don't mean that in a Terminator way, but I mean that in a way that's like, although that's real too, according to Elon. Uh, I mean that much more in a, like reading that now border agents can search your social media profiles when you're coming into this country. Or can look at the books you're transporting and see what kind of books they are and if... if Believe it or not, that has not gotten as much press as the fact no, that they can rifle not. through your social media. Yeah. Um, but I think that it's the same thing. I think that books are something that are immovable. I think social media is alive and living, and they can dig into who you are as a person now, whereas before, it was the person in front of me, and that's it. And that's, that's terrifying for me. But I bring up the positive because, I, again, I think that this is a tidal wave that's coming, and what can we do to be a part of this? When you say tidal wave, do you mean, what do you mean, actually? I mean this all-consuming force that's going to change everything that, that touches every facet of our lives. Um, and that sounds hyperbolic, and I don't mean it uh, hyperbolically, I, I, as, as hyperbole, I mean that very literally. I think technology is going to change, and it is changing. This is such like a, it's a platitude that it's going to change everything we do, but it, it's going to change every fabric of who we are as a human being, right down to relationships, to human interaction, to everything else. It's what we've been speaking to. Yeah. It's already happened. The, the change, the inflection point was five, ten years ago. Well, you told me something that surprised me greatly when we spoke on the phone briefly yesterday. You said, I hate the phone. I absolutely, well, I love this computer more than anything. It's my pacifier. It's my favorite object in the world. You ha I, you hate, can yeah. I hate talking on the telephone. Why? Neither of my phones ring, no matter who's calling. Um, they don't even make a noise. Notifications, you know, like you turn them off so you don't hear Twitter notifications. I have my phone app notifications off. My SMS app notifications off. My relationship with this device, which I love and I worship, um, is purely reactive. I choose to react to it. Um, it. This doesn't proactively come into my life. It doesn't ring and say, Casey, give me your attention. Uh, it's interesting because before people used to do this sign and now they do now they this do. sign, yeah. But why this? Uh, um... The why is because despite my um, absolute there's affinity... There's a paradox. There, there's a paradox, and there's, this, this, is a con this is a complete contradiction. Uh, people my, don't make sense, so... so I don't yeah. make anything. I don't, nothing, I don't make sense in anything I do. Um, <laughs> very good at not making sense. Despite my affinity for technology and all that it is, the thing that I hold more precious than anything else... It's IRL. Is, is IRL um, in real life. We were emailing earlier this week and I was like, we should get together IRL. And there was like a series of panicky emails from Paul being like, don't know what IRL is, but I will figure this out. <laughs> um, but there's nothing I hold more precious than physically being present. When I'm at home with my family, like, don't care what else is going on in the world. When I'm here with you, don't care what else is going on in the world. And this is what matters the most. And like, I literally get insulted when people call me. It's like, how fucking dare you? Do you know what I'm doing right now? Like, how dare you think that you can just interrupt my life? They're a very old school thing that, that my parents do. It's when the phone rings, the world has to stop. They have to answer that because this is the most important thing. I think that's completely backwards. I'm like, no, no, this is the most important thing. 
Um, so I hate phones. I hate talking on the phone. I hate when the phone rings. I hate it having just, to call I, people. I'll, I'll, I'll offer a different view of it. I, I think phones have become highly exotic, but there was a time, which certainly during my lifetime, where phones could be a great um, a form of, of complicity and proximity. So, you know, the, I think it's partly perhaps because the age in which you grew up. Phone, I mean, I think that it, your younger child now probably won't know what a phone is. Actually, in the library, we still have a few phones. It's quite interesting. They're cool. They're really cool. They have wires. They, they have wires. <laughs> And, and I once interviewed William Gibson uh, from one phone to the other, which was quite cool. Um, yeah. Um, a little bit more, a tidbit more, especially after you told me that you're here now completely and, and nothing else matters. Um, somebody submitted this question to me. If you could not use the Internet for one year, what would you do? It's something that I fantasize about to a degree that is like maybe unhealthy. There's the okay, lead us down. Yeah, there's the Stefan Sagmeister sort of philosophy on life, which is I don't know what his exact prescription is, but it's every four years I believe he shuts down his entire company and everybody gets a full year off with full salaries and full benefits, and they shut down everything, the website, everything. When they come back a year later, everything's been reset with a fresh brain, and I am completely exhausted because I, you know, I, I operate on a typically like 18 to 22 hour day, seven days a week. I wake up at 4.16 a.m. Sunday through Sunday, every so, day. So, so the question is... Um, what would I do without yeah, the, the internet? The question is, because I've, uh, the fantasy is real. I know some people who act on it. Lawrence Lessig, um, every June or July, declares email bankruptcy. He deletes everything and he says, if you want to get in touch with me, write to me on September 1st. And then he starts again because he just can't deal with the tens of thousands of messages he gets. But what, let, let's say that for a moment there just ain't no electricity. Nothing is working. You can't access the internet. What does Casey Neistat do? What do you do? I mean, there's so many versions of this hypothetical. So if there's one where it's just the internet shuts off, then like that's very exciting. Um, if there's one where I deliberately leave the internet, and my wife and I go to an island somewhere with the family, then like it's wonderful. I'm present as I am now, and I embrace them, and I, I shut off that part of my life. Um, if it's a apocalypse situation where the internet disappears, I'm very good with my hands. I can build things. I'm a good work, good woodworker. I could fucking rebuild the transmission in like 25 minutes. Like I can make things. Like I can. Which is something you want. Which is a value. Doing. Like my hands are covered in calluses. Never trust a man who has soft hands. <laughs> um, no, I mean, look, I say that as a fantasy because to me this goes back to where we started this conversation about me being so overwhelmed with opportunity um, and a complete reluctance to say no to any opportunities because when I was younger, I would do anything for a single opportunity and now I feel like I can't squander them. So I just embrace, embrace, embrace. But I do fantasize about turning things off. My wife and I have like a schedule. It's December 30th, 2019. I'm not kidding. It's like four months where I want to go off the grid. I know it's like a long time away. I'll probably, will probably, the whole world will probably be gone by then. Like a meteor, like something's going to happen. <laughs> Only because I've been really looking forward to that time. Some shit's going to rain on my parade. But like that's the, that's how far in the future I look when I think of an opportunity to really turn life off. A question from my 15-year-old son, Sam, um, who you, you met a, uh, briefly earlier, he, he asks this, if you could remake any movie by any director, what movie would it be? God, that's a really, what are you feeding this kid? That is a really good question. <laughs> um, the tough thing about remakes is they only ever remake good movies, and good movies have no business being remade. I think you have to take a bad movie, like a poorly executed movie, and remake that. So there's a movie called The Final Countdown, 
um, 1970s, something like that, and this is the premise of the movie. They had like the most modern day warship at this point in time. It was like the US Ronald Reagan or something like this, like a gigantic aircraft carrier, and it goes through a time portal, and it comes out the day before the Pearl Harbor attack in 1944. And they're like, right now we can destroy, destroy the entire Japanese Navy with our one ship, because it's from the future. And then like, it gets awesome. The movie's terrible. But that sounds very exciting. I would love to remake that. Like, one of the movies that I wanted to remake, and I even started a script, was um, Red Dawn. And then they remade it, and they, like, killed it. Red Dawn's a movie about, like, the Russians invade in the 80s and a bunch of ragtag kids and escape into the hills and fight back. Like, I love that idea. I want to do a video where, like, the North Koreans invade. <laughs> and, like, a bunch of ragtag kids escape, and they fight back. That would be great. So, um... In, in, you've said that your favorite book is Malcolm X. Yeah, the autobiography of Malcolm X. Why? I mean, there, there's, there, the answer to that is multifaceted for sure, but one, Malcolm X is an individual that I'm just absolutely fascinated by. Um, certainly, first and foremost, his contribution to the civil rights movement, but moving all of that aside, everything that everybody knows about Malcolm X aside, focusing on him as an individual, I think he is sort of the quintessential 21st century autodidact in a way that I find tremendously inspiring. Um, he was a bona fide thug. He was a stick-up artist. He used to rob people in Harlem to buy drugs. And he got put in jail. And while in jail, he found himself in books. And he read so much in jail with such little light that he de developed an astigmatism in both eyes. And that's why he wears those glasses that we know Malcolm X has. But he went into jail a thug an absolute thug um, who robbed people for money, and he came out of jail being one of the most instrumental civil rights leaders of, of um, the entire generation. And to me, like, that is such a romantic thing, someone who only in the last couple of years have I overcome the insecurity that is my own lack of education. Someone who... You, you're speaking for yourself, Yeah, absolutely. Too. Yeah. Um, I'm speaking for myself very literally. No, no, but no, but you're speaking for yourself in terms of someone who didn't finish school. Yeah, I, mean, I, I harbored that insecurity. And in only, only recently does it feel lessened. Yeah, I mean, the MIT thing's a big fuck you to anybody who's like, he ain't got no high school. So I'm good. I'm good with that. <laughs> um, but no, I, I've overcome it. Like, I have much more confidence now. I'm no longer insecure about that. But I used to be tremendously insecure about that. When I first moved to New York City and I started to sort of hang out in the art community a little bit, and I was six months away from being that chowder pot scrubber and I was a bike messenger to make ends meet, I remember, like, entering into conversations and not knowing what people were talking about. And I, I would be terrified that somebody might look or make eye contact with me in a way that might uh, invite me participating in this conversation and me not being able to do that because I didn't know how or what to say. I remember like hearing a conversation about World War II. I was in New York City in my 20s before, the, for the, before I heard people talking about World War II as a conversation for the first time ever. I couldn't have told you what decade World War II took place in. Um, you know, there, my, one of my favorite books in the whole world is called The Second World War. And it is literally like a 900-page textbook on World War II. I read it cover to cover three times. Like, a, a, World War II is an obsession. And it's because of that one conversation. Um, and much of my life was just that. I mean, I remember I was an artist assistant, and it, it got me all the way to, like, I was in Salzburg, Austria. And Tom Krenz, who then maybe still is, was the head of the Guggenheim Museum. Was. was. And I, I'd never met the guy, I just knew he was a big deal. And I was there as sort of an artist assistant, like an art handler. And he's a big motorcyclist. And somebody yeah. introduced him to me, and he looked at me and he said, Casey, here's the keys to my motorcycle. It's a BMW, it's just outside. They loaned it to me in Germany. Do you mind driving this back to, to Germany for me? I'll, I'll have somebody organize your flight. And it was like, I'm a starving kid. Here's an opportunity to do a favor for the most important man in the art world. It involves driving a motorcycle from one European country to another, and he's going to take care of everything for me. And I took the keys, and I was like, of course, Mr. Krenz, I'll take care of this. And he was like, cool, you have your motorcycle license, right? And, uh, and I gave him the keys back. Um, I will give you one guess what the next four months of my life were completely committed to doing. Getting that fucking M endorsement on my driver's license. That will never happen to me again. Ever. That exact scenario will never happen to me again because I am now an expert motorcyclist. 
And that kind of understanding was something I applied to everything when I moved to New York City. It was like books. I would just like, people would talk about something and I'd like write it down in my notebook, then go home, find a book on that, and then read that book cover to cover. And then the next day, I'd be like, remember how you guys were talking about World War II last night? Who wants to talk Poland? <laughs> and like, that's what, that's what it was. So to Malcolm X, the, the autobiography of Malcolm X was one of the first books in that journey for me. And it was the transformative power. It was like him educating himself brought him from being a thug who should have like been dead in jail to being somebody who truly changed this country and, and changed you know, this world. And he said something in a, in a speech on media in 1963. He said, the media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and to make the guilty innocent. And that's power because they control the minds of the masses. And I think that Donald Trump would second that quote right now. And I would, I don't, I don't mean that in a, in a negative way at all, but I would push back against that tremendously. I think the shift we've seen since he said that has been that that power has shifted away from them to the masses. And I think that's why, like, you know, what was my job before I became a YouTuber? I had a show on HBO that I wrote, directed, and produced. Like, why walk away from the sexiest brand in all of media to go to the one that, like, YouTube in 2010 was about cat videos and ripped NBA highlights. Like, it was not a clean place to be. It wasn't a place where you build a career, but it was, the, how, what a, it was a, a true meritocracy. It was a democratic way of distributing video that had never existed before. It was a way of pulling the power away from the few and giving it to the many. And that's why, you know... The Kardashians is like the most talked about reality show ever. And The Kardashians does, you know, on a good week, two million views or something like that on a weekly show. The top vloggers on YouTube are doing 12 million views a day every single day. And like, I think there's a reluctance to recognize the impact and understand that that sort of the impact uh, on society is, is fungible. And if it's coming from over here, it's going over here. Um, but it, it, that conversation is not so mainstream just yet because I think we're so fixated on that Malcolm X quote. We're so fixated on Kim Kardashian socially matters, the, societally matters the most because she is this fixture that the establishment has said she's our fixture. And a YouTuber who's doing, you know, 500 million views a month, people don't know what that means. So the opportunity to interpret that as powerfully, uh, with the same impact of a, of a Kardashian show, um, isn't there yet. But that shift, I think, we're seeing take place, and I think it is transformative. And I think it, this conversation will be very different five years from now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Take a minute.